Welcome back to International Relations 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topics are how peacekeeping and peacemaking work. Those are similar words, but they're actually slightly different. Peacemaking is referring to a situation where war is currently ongoing and someone from the international community is doing something to stop that war and shift those actors into peace. In contrast, peacekeeping is a situation where the parties are already at peace and the international community is doing something to ensure that the situation remains peaceful into the future. The reason I'm covering both in the same lecture is that the underlying mechanisms can oftentimes overlap. So we're going to do them together. And in fact, let's get to it now. We've already seen an example of peacemaking. Think about the critical barrier to civil war settlement. Here we have an ongoing war, and the rebels refuse to surrender because they fear that once they give up their arms, the government will be able to exploit them into the future. A third party can resolve this problem by providing a security guarantee to those rebels. If the rebels give up their arms, the third party assures the rebels that if the government tries to exploit the rebels in the future, the third party will protect them. Now having the confidence that they're not going to be exploited, the rebels are willing to surrender and they can have a fair peace into the future. This is peacemaking because we're going from a situation where war is ongoing to a situation where we have peace. And it's all because of that third party. Another mechanism is mediation. These are situations where the third party actively involves itself in negotiations, with the hope being that something that the mediator does causes the otherwise warring parties to reach a settlement instead. One example of this is known as shuttle diplomacy. This is where a mediator listens to what one side has to say and then relays that information to the other side. That's what happened during the Camp David summit. Jimmy Carter essentially acted as a go-between. He would hear what Egypt had to say, tell it to Israel, hear what Israel had to say, tell it to Egypt, and so forth. Despite the political narrative that this sort of shuttle diplomacy was effective with the Camp David summit and ultimately led to the Camp David Accords, International relations scholars are skeptical of shuttle diplomacy. The central problem is that if I were to have an incentive to lie to my opponent, then I would have that same incentive to lie to the mediator. So the mediator, by purely relaying information, can't accomplish any settlement that we, the two warring parties, couldn't do ourselves. Another type of mediation is information provision. This is a situation where the mediator knows something about the facts on the ground that the parties don't and tries to communicate that information to them. You might think that an organization like the United Nations, which ostensibly has a goal to minimize war, would be the perfect type of mediator under those circumstances. Turns out, though, that it's a little bit trickier than that. Think back to how war occurs with uncertainty. It follows a very specific pathway. You have a situation where one side is unsure about whether its opponent is weaker or stronger. Here, A doesn't know whether it's relatively strong, in which case it can take a lot of the good for itself, or it's relatively weak and it can't take as much. For war to occur under those circumstances, A needs to be relatively optimistic, putting a high degree of probability on it having lots of that military power such that the optimal demand it's going to make under that uncertainty is going to be large. War then occurs whatever portion of the time that A was not actually that strong. And in fact, B was strong. So that stronger type of B rejects the demand and fights a war. Now imagine that you're a third party and your only goal here is to minimize the probability of war then you have a singular task at hand. It is to do everything in your power to convince A that the situation most resembles what's at the bottom of the screen rather than what's at the top of the screen. That's because if you can successfully convince A of that, A is going to make a very small demand. And at that point, it doesn't matter whether the opponent is the weak type or the strong type. It's going to accept because it's getting a large concession. 
Again, if you want to minimize war and maximize peace, all you should be doing in that mediation process is convincing each side of its relative weakness. And therein lies the problem. Imagine that we have the United Nations as the mediator, and I know that the only thing that they want to do is maximize peace. Then I can infer that whatever they're telling me is designed to get me to make a small demand and a large offer to my opponent so that the probability of war is going down. In turn, I cannot update my information based off of what I'm hearing. I know that incentive to lie is too strong. So the United Nations, an entity that might be biased toward peace, can't credibly communicate or relay that information, even if they know something that I don't. Fortunately, information provision can work under some circumstances. One way is to have the provider of the information have similar preferences to you. Think about the relationship between the United States and Canada as an example. They have relatively aligned geopolitical preferences. So if Canada were to try to convey some information about whether the United States' opponent is weak or strong, the United States has an incentive to believe Canada there. That's because Canada wants an outcome that is very similar to what the United States wants, and so it's in Canada's best interest to provide true information to the United States, telling the United States that it's strong when it's strong and relatively weak when it's relatively weak. Another solution is to provide verifiable information. That's what happened on a Robert Gates trip to India and Pakistan in 1990. At the time, Gates was the national security advisor to the president, and would later go on to become the director of the CIA, as well as the Secretary of Defense. During this period, India and Pakistan were having tensions flare up. What Gates did was provide information to each of those countries about what the United States was simulating in its war games, trying to figure out what would happen in a war between India and Pakistan. Gates provided that intelligence information to both of those countries, and those countries could go back to their intelligence advisors and verify that the information that Gates was providing was accurate. And sure enough, what that information was telling them was that war would not be in the best interest of either of those countries. And that helped India and Pakistan settle the crisis in 1990. Moving on to the next mechanism, we have peace subsidies. This is the third party getting out its checkbook and providing some sort of payment to one or both sides, but only in the event of peace. They are subsidizing the peace with that monetary payment. For an example of peace subsidies, we only have to go back to the Camp David Accords. It makes a nice political story to say that Jimmy Carter's skillful diplomacy is what allowed those two countries to come together and reach an agreement. But behind the scenes, the United States was writing a very large check and providing military aid to Egypt and Israel if they were to sign the agreement. And so being given that subsidy convinces them to not try to fight over the good that they have at stake, because if they were to do that, they would be endangering the payments that they would be receiving from the United States. The next mechanism is monitoring disarmament. This is geared toward the peacekeeping side of things. After an agreement has been made, it might be the case that in the implementation phase, each side is supposed to slowly reduce their amount of live armaments so that we can have a more peaceful world between the two combatants. We've seen that this sort of agreement can succeed in a repeated prisoner's dilemma framework. We both begin by cooperating. Here, that means following the agreement that we had on the piece of paper and reducing our level of armaments by some small amount. Then, in the next period, we continue to disarm as long as everyone has been disarming beforehand. This works because if someone were to defect and continue their armaments, then that would inspire the other side to break down that cooperation and continue to defect in every single period afterward. So the threat of future defection, here, maintaining your armaments, is going to convince each of the sides to continue cooperating by disarming in each period. But as we've seen before, for any of this to work, 
it needs to be the case that we can observe defections. If I cannot observe whether you cooperated or defected in the previous period, then I cannot trigger my strategy to defect on you. I don't know what you've done. And because I don't observe what you've done, you have no incentive to cooperate in the first period because you could cheat on the agreement, get a little bit better of a payoff today, and then not be punished for it in the future. And because both of us can infer that perverse incentive, neither of us are willing to cooperate, and we get mutual defection. In other words, the treaty that we've signed is never going to be implemented. Fortunately, peacekeepers can solve this problem. They can simply observe what the other side is doing and report back to the original side. The peacekeepers can monitor the rebels, see that the rebels are disarming, and tell that to the government. They can also monitor the government and tell that piece of information to the rebel group. What makes third-party monitoring more effective here than having the parties do that themselves is that the third party can just report the information about whether we have cooperation or whether we have defection, whether we have disarmament or whether we have continued armament. If you had the rebel group trying to do that level of monitoring themselves, it might be the case that the rebel group could get useful military information about the government's vulnerabilities, and as a consequence, use that information to attack the government, or vice versa. The peacekeepers don't have that sort of problem. They can report just the information about disarmament or armament and not report on strategic vulnerabilities. That builds trust and results in peace being able to work out. On the flip side of things, peacekeepers can also monitor the agreement itself. Throughout this course, as we've talked about bargain settlements, we've assumed that the division of the policy at stake has been directly observable. This is slightly different than what we just got done talking about. Before, we were talking about armaments, which is not the policy in dispute. Here, I'm referring specifically to the thing that we have to divide between us. For example, a rebel group might want to have better physical integrity rights for a minority population within the government's borders. That would mean reduction in police abuses, as an example. The problem with that is that abuses like that are not easily observed. So we could say on paper that we're going to split the good that's at dispute within the bargaining range, so both of us are better off, but then privately the government could be actually implementing something that's different, that's worse for the rebel group than what it had anticipated getting in terms of what was actually written on the paper. This can go both ways. A government might want a rebel group to reduce the amount of smuggling contraband that they're doing across borders. But that is, once more, something that is not easily observed. It could be the case that the rebel group promises not to involve themselves in smuggling anymore, so that an agreement is mutually preferable to both parties. But then once the agreement is signed, because the rebel group wagers that the government is not able to observe those violations, they continue to smuggle at will. Well, like before, the third party can help out by providing some sort of monitoring. They can check whether the government is abusing the physical integrity rights of the minority group. Or likewise, they can monitor whether there is over-the-border smuggling of contraband. And if there are those sorts of violations, they can report those violations to the other side. And the other side, realizing that they're no longer getting an agreement that's actually falling within that bargaining range, can revert back to war. Fortunately, because of the threat to revert back to war and the credible monitoring from the third party, neither of the players has an incentive to actually violate the agreement at all. It works out for everyone. The final mechanism for today is reducing first strike advantages. We've seen before that sufficient first strike advantages lead to preemptive war. That's because having a first strike advantage gives each side a larger payoff for war if they were to strike while the other side is unprepared. And if those first strike advantages are too large, specifically the sum of the first strike advantages is larger than the sum costs of war, then the total minimum amount that the parties need, when you combine that together, might exceed the total amount of the policy that actually exists. And if that's the case, we're stuck with war. That type of preemptive war doesn't really benefit anyone, 
but luckily there is something that the sides can do to reduce the probability of it occurring. In fact, this is a common explanation for why you see demilitarized zones, like this one between South Korea and North Korea. Giving extra space between the countries ensures that if a war were to start, there would be a little bit more heads-up time for the other side to observe what's happening and prepare its defenses. That reduces the first strike advantage, and as a consequence, could allow for an agreement to work for both parties. And it might be worth paying a third party or reducing the amount of total land that you have available to you if it means that you're going to go from a situation with war and lots of inefficiency to a situation with peace and a little bit of inefficiency as a consequence of the demilitarized zone. That wraps up this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope to see you next time. Take care.